Today in Across the Fence, we're getting all dressed up for two new exhibitions at UVM's Fleming Museum. We'll go fashion first with a look at 19th century style and culture, and later we head home to learn about a new student-curated exhibition. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. The Victorian age is always in fashion. Whether you're a royal watcher or a fan of historical costume dramas, the elegance and extravagance of the Victorian age remains endlessly fascinating. This fall, UVM's Fleming Museum is showcasing the impossible ideal, Victorian fashion and femininity. The exhibition displays corsets, hoop skirts and bustles. It also puts in context who wore these clothes, why, and what it meant to be a woman then, and the Victorian age's impact on women today. Joining me for a behind-the-scenes look, a sneak peek at this latest exhibit at the Fleming Museum, is curator Andrea Rosen. It's great to be back here with you. Thanks for being here. Now, although we're shooting this before the exhibition opens, it's still very impressive. Tell me about this show and how it all came together. So the Fleming has an amazing collection of, of fashion, particularly 19th century. So it doesn't get shown often because it's difficult to put together, but um, this came out of an intern's project. Uh, she was excited about researching that collection and I said, why not turn it into a show? And so all these dresses belong to real people. Yes, yes. Um, m many of them Vermonters who um, gave their, their family heirloom dresses to the Fleming collection. So give us some historical context. What's the time span of the Victorian age? So we define the Victorian era by the reign of Queen Victoria of Britain. So she reigned from 1837 to 1901 until El Elizabeth II, the longest reign uh, in British history. And it's also a defining era in terms of the development of the Industrial Revolution and consumer culture, magazines, mass print, um, and that had a big impact on, on fashion and women's lives. And so one of the dresses here has a direct connection to UVM. Yes. Um, a blue dress in our entrance was worn by a woman who graduated from UVM in 1878. It was worn for her graduation from UVM. And UVM started admitting women in 1871. So she was in the fourth graduating class, co-ed graduating class, um, was a member of uh, Women's Academic Honor Society. So you know, this is a time also when educational opportunities for women are expanding. And the uh, women's magazines that a lot of women are turning to for fashion advice are also advocating for more opportunities for women to be educated. Give me some examples in this dress what you're talking about as far as how the fashion changed. In that blue dress, so that is really, you know, indicative of that uh, late 70s era when um, silhouettes become more slim. Um, you'll see a lot of dresses in the show that have that big wide hoop skirt from the 1860s. This is sort of more um, than bustles develop, that big rear mound, mm -hmm. and this is a time when the, that silhouette becomes slimmer and instead of like a two-piece dress, you see one long piece of fabric going all the way down. Mm -hmm. And so the title of the exhibition is The Impossible Ideal. What's impossible here and what's ideal? Right, so you know, we also think in the Victorian era of this cult of true womanhood. You know, a woman's meant to stay at home with the kids, manage a household expertly. Um, you know, all these expectations on, are put on her and all these limitations of what she can't do, which, you know, a woman shouldn't work. A woman should be this uh, bastion of moral purity in the family. Um, and of course, we know that that's unrealistic. And we also know that, you know, a lot of we think of this era, we think of mostly wealthy white women, mm -hmm. and that's a lot of what's represented in this show in terms of who these belong to, but we know that American women came in all classes, all races, um, many had to work, um, so we try to represent that in the show in an introductory section with um, photos of American women of diverse backgrounds. And we're going to take a look at some of these amazing dresses in a minute, but I also want to ask about the photos and illustrations in this show and what role they play. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned those photos that show more diverse women of, of many backgrounds, but you'll also see throughout the show these hand-colored engravings that were the, the fashion plates that came in these women's magazines. So this is what women are looking to, to to get a sense of what the latest fashions are. Many of them are copied from French or British plates, so they're getting their sense of fashion from across the, the pond in Europe. Um, and they also they show those changing silhouettes. And, and those ideals that women are trying to live up to, like the, the narrow corseted waist. Tiny, like tiny waist. Yes, yes. So we'll sh be showing some corsets and underwear, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so how um, did these magazines and fashion begin the debate of what you call in the show the woman question? Yeah, so many of these women's magazines going back to early in the era are edited by women or have many contributions from women authors. So even as they're advo 
advocating that women should stay home. Many of the contributors are not. They're working women who are writers or editors. Sarah Hale was the editor of the most popular magazine of the era, Godey's Ladies Book. She was the editor for 40 years. And she was one of the uh, fierce advocates for, for women's education. At the same time, she was not pro-suffrage. Mm -hmm. So there is that complex ambivalence about w how far women, certain women want to go in terms of the, the quest for rights, and that debate plays out in some of the magazines. Interesting. Well, earlier, Andrea gave me a tour of the gallery uh, to look at a few of the dresses on display and learn the stories about the women who wore them. So Andrea, tell me about this first dress that we're going to be looking at here. So this dress was worn by a woman named Martha Wardner Lamson. She was the daughter of a Vermont state treasurer, and she married uh, the son of a Windsor, Vermont gun factory owner. So pretty wealthy woman. She got married in 1865, and when a wealthy woman married, she, she brought a trousseau into her marriage, a whole collection of fine garments to wear in her married life. So this was part of her trousseau when she married in 1865, it would have at that point been worn with a big, wide crinoline hoop skirt. Right. So what we see here is that um, she had it altered later in the 1870s to suit the silhouette of that time, which is that bustle, that, that rear mound. Mm -hmm. um, well, and is that pretty typical of women redoing their clothes as opposed to buying new? Yes, even wealthy women. Fabric was expensive, dressmaking was expensive, so you would do your best to remake garments to suit changing silhouettes. Or, you know, you also wore different styles of dress, different times of day. So originally she had this dress with a, an evening bodice, low neck, short sleeves, and it seems that when she altered the skirt to suit her expanding waistline as well <laughs> as the changing styles, she also had a new bodice made for daytime wear with the extra fabric that she took from the skirt. That's terrific, and the colors are, are pretty vibrant for even a dress that's old. Yes, yes, so we've, we preserve them well, and yeah, this is a beautiful, what we call a changeable silk, so a, woven with different color threads, so it changes color as you move it. Oh, terrific. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at the next one. All right. So what have we here? A big ball gown. Yeah, so this is that a typical example of that 1860s worn with a big, wide, bell-shaped hoop skirt. Um, even maybe late 1850s. This was worn by a woman named Mary Sawyer Bellinger. She was from the, the Sawyer family of the Burlington area. And you actually have a picture of her wearing this dress. Yes, and we'll show that in the show. And it's a convertible dress. So in the picture, she's wearing it as an evening gown with that low neck, short sleeve. And then she had these convertible pieces added. So this cape that she could remove and put on for more modest day wear and removable sleeves as well that she could just tie on right under there. Now, I notice you're wearing gloves. It's obviously very important not to touch anything in this exhibit. Yes, exactly. We ask our visitors, as always, not to touch the artworks, and we try when we handle them to only touch them with gloves. Right, and, and I, I love the fact that we have the photograph of her wearing this exact dress. Very special. It's, I discovered that partway through the process. I was so thrilled to find that in the collection. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see what's next. All right. And now this third dress is pretty spectacular. It is. This is one of my favorites. It's pretty gorgeous. It was worn by a woman to a reception for the Prince of Wales, Queen Victoria's really? son, who was visiting the U.S. in 1860. So as you can see, really elaborate uh, material and technique in terms of that uh, damask um, uh, floral design on the skirt. And um, you know, really wealthy woman would travel to Paris once a year to buy her fashions. That was the height of fashion and luxury. And and that's what a really wealthy woman would do to, to get outfitted for the year. And once again, how would these women find out what the latest fashion is? Again, those women's magazines provided a really crucial um, messaging. They, they copied fashions from France and Britain. So that's what women were looking towards. So a woman who would wear this dress is sending a very definite signal. Yes, that she is the height of fashion, height of wealth, to be able to afford this latest um, dress uh, and the amazing fabric and technique mm -hmm. and skill that went into it. We talk about these dresses, but they're also undergarments people can see as well, and shoes, mm -hmm. which yeah, is really amazing. Yeah, a lot of accessories, yeah, so I mean all the elements, some of the elements, it's sort of the tip of the iceberg <laughs> of what a woman would need to put into putting her outfit together. It's a lot of material. Exactly, which is why so many women had maids. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Andrea, thank you so much for this tour. It's been thank fun. Thank you, Judy. The Fleming also has a new exhibit this fall, another new exhibit. It's called House to Home. On display, you'll find decorative art objects from Africa, Asia, and the Americas. The exhibition compares and contrasts how a house defines a place, while a home is built from relationships, experiences, and memories. Seventeen UVM students worked with museum staff to curate this exhibit. 
The student work was part of a UVM anthropology class, and the professor for that class was Jennifer Dickinson, who joins me now. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. How does an anthropology class come to work in a museum of art? Well, I think it's really important to understand that the Fleming Collection is actually foundationally a material culture collection. So we have actually a, a, a picture in the exhibit of Henry Legrand Cannon, which was, who was a major collector and contributor. And he's sitting in a room filled with objects that he collected on his travels around the world. And so um, this is an opportunity to showcase some of those anthropological objects and historical objects in addition to art. And so what were some of the responsibilities that the students had to take on to curate this exhibit? They did everything. So really? they, chose the, they, they chose their objects, they researched them, they had to make drawings of them, they, had, they did the layout, they did the PR, they did everything soup to nuts so that they could get a sense of what it was truly like to work in a museum in different capacities and to organize a, a real exhibit. How long did that take? A semester. We, we pushed them hard. They, they get their first object on the very first day of class. No kidding? Yeah. Okay, so the exhibition focuses on some everyday objects. Some of them will be familiar, others not so much. What objects did the students pick and why? Uh, they, you know, they picked a whole range. One of their favorites is uh, something called a ditty box. And it's a small round box that's sitting on the mantle in the exhibit. And it's something sailors took to sea with them to take small mementos of home. And so that was an object that really captured the ima imagination and made them think about what is home when you are away from the structure that defines your, your is home. Is there something in that box? There's not anything in this particular object, but um, usually there would be some mending tools and then, and then small precious objects that would be things that would remind them of lo beloved ones while they were away. Was there a favorite house to home object for the students? I would say that one was one of the top ones, and then they also really enjoyed the model houses that we had. So the, the Fleming has a collection of, of different kinds of model houses and dioramas that were used as teaching tools in the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's um, that quality, that childlike quality would really come out with that added intellectual component of exploring this um, l this small replica that was made for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think the students will take away from this, this experience? I think that the students, um, many of them took away a real love of museum work and some of them are pursuing museum work uh, you know, as their next stage of professionalization. But I think all of them took away the, the experience of working very intensely in a group with a unified purpose and having to negotiate. A lot of them commented on 17 curators is a lot for an exhibit, and they had to do a museum-level pro professional negotiation to accomplish that. And what about some of the descriptions of the objects? Um, how was that researched? Uh, well, we worked very closely with libraries to teach them techniques that maybe are not the ones that they would use in a regular term paper. You know, you, you Google art sites, you look at catalogs for exhibitions, and you begin to find out small details, or you contact even um, other curators to find out those little pieces. So it was great for them. Did the students have a chance to talk to any local people about, about some of these objects? You know, I don't think that any of these objects are ones that, that they focus on, although um, I think uh, Calvin Coolidge's door latch is in the exhibit, <laughs> so there is a very local Vermont component right there. What about you? What did you learn from working with the museum and these students? Every time I work with the museum, it is uh, a revelation um, it's, it's such an exciting opportunity to, to reveal new hidden treasures in the collection and, um, and get students excited by hands-on work that brings all of their training to bear. So I always learn something from the students and something from the work that goes into collaborating on an exhibit like this. And to think that you get to, to put out in front of the audience something that probably hasn't been seen by folks in years and years yes. and years. Yeah, we always try to, to choose objects that are less often shown. Um, there's always a story. Okay, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining right. us. The two exhibits we focused on today, The Impossible Ideal and House to Home, run until December 14th. For admission, gallery hours, or to learn about other treasures of the Fleming Museum of Art, visit the website flemingmuseum.org or call 802-656-2090. Once again, our thanks to our friends here at the Fleming Museum, and thanks to you for joining us. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.